this podcast may contain explicit language. Welcome to the Greatest Movie of All Time podcast, the show that uses a unique rating style to redefine what the greatest movies are. I'm Tom Duncan. And I'm Dana Duncan. Tonight, for our 205th episode, we discuss the religious drama, The Passion of the Christ, celebrating its 20th anniversary a few weeks ago. Written and directed by Mill Gibson, with Benedict Fitzgerald, music by John Dibney, starring Jim Caviezel as Jesus Christ, Maya Morgenstern as Mary, the mother of Jesus, Christo Yivkov as John, I hope I pronounced that right. Some of these are a little bit challenging. Francesco DeVito as Peter. Monica Bellucci as Mary Magdalene. Mattia Sabragia as Caiaphas. Tony Bertarelli as Annas Ben Seth. Luca Lionello as Judas Iscariot. Christo Naumov Shopov as Pontius Pilate. Claudia Garini as Claudia Procles, Fabio Sartor as Abinader, Gia Quinto Ferro as Joseph of Arimathea, and Oleg Mincer as Nicodemus. Recognition for this movie, The Passion of the Christ opened in the United States on February 25th, 2004, which also happened to be Ash Wednesday that particular year. The film tied with The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King's record for having the highest five-day Wednesday opening. Moreover, The Passion of the Christ scored the second biggest opening weekend for any R-rated movie, behind The Matrix Reloaded. It went on to earn $370.8 million overall in the United States and remains the highest grossing R-rated film in the domestic market. But not overall, I think that was surpassed by Joker a few years ago. Despite the many controversies and refusals by some governments to allow the film to be viewed in wide release, The Passion of the Christ earned $612 million worldwide on a budget of $30 million. The film was also a relative success in certain countries with large Muslim populations, such as in Egypt, where it ranked 20th overall in its box office numbers for 2004. The film was the highest grossing non-English language film of all time until 2017, when it was surpassed by Wolf Warrior 2, which I believe is a Chinese film or a Chinese franchise. The film would go on to have similar impact in the home video rental DVD market as well. At the time of its release, The Passion of the Christ was widely deadpanned for its use of violence and for its overall message, but maintained a few favorable critics, including Roger Ebert. Additionally, the film would receive three Academy Award nominations for Best Original Score, makeup, and cinematography. The film has since endured many different controversies, including a variety of accusations of anti-Semitism. The Passion of the Christ currently holds a 49% among critics on Rotten Tomatoes, a 47 score on Metacritic, and a 3.3 out of 5 on Letterboxd. So, Dad, as we start every week, what is your relationship to this film? Saw it at the uh, theater, I believe, with your mother. I don't remember if we took all of you kids with us or not, but... And I believe I think, you did because I distinctly remember seeing it in, I guess, so 2004, I would have been 14. a freshman in high school, I think. And it would have been when I was still attending parochial school before I so made 13. the move to. Yeah, probably because I probably didn't turn 14 until that summer. But yeah, I would have been maybe my the last part of my eighth grade year. So going into high school somewhere about that period. Yeah, I don't remember if we took the girls or not, because it is R, and it's highly violent. Yeah, I would be surprised if you did, but I know that given the subject material and how much it was discussed, particularly around that time, because I was, I think, in the ending stages of confirmation classes, that it became a big deal to take those of us that were a little bit before the R rating availability, as long as we were with a parent. Yeah. This was also about the time and discussion in my young life where I had certain teachers of mine that said it was never appropriate to watch an R-rated movie. (laughs) Okay. I won't name any names, 
but that is the downsides of attending a parochial school. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I think uh, I may have watched it one other time with your mother. I may want to say that we rented it one time so that your grandparents could see it because they're not um, they're not overly inclined to go to the theater. Well, for obvious reasons, with my grandfather's inability to hear except on a closed circuit microphone system. They didn't go before that either. No, but this would have been after that had happened anyway, because about this time was when he specifically asked me to take him to Master and Commander, which I think was the year before. Yes. Because that was a favorite book series of his. Yes. I do remember that. I specifically remember, though, this being a fairly big deal that we were talking about and became a huge topic of discussion given the circumstances and environment that I was in at the time. Again, having attended confirmation classes about this time or this time period, it served as something that was of constant discussion as a piece that would supposedly enhance my view of Easter that particular year. Now, I don't think it was explicitly said that way, but I think that the advertising for the film among the Protestant community, and I don't know if we've ever truly discussed religion per se on the podcast itself. I know we've often identified our political leanings, but I don't think we've ever specifically said what we are religiously. I would claim to be in some way Lutheran, although unaffiliated at this particular moment in time, and at worst, maybe Protestant in an American tradition for what it is worth. And so the circumstances of this film and what it meant at the time that it was billed as or advertised as word of mouth campaign within Christian or Protestant circles as being a more accurate and realistic depiction of the suffering of Jesus Christ ultimately in the moments leading up to his death. Now, having watched this again for the first time in 20 years, I'm not sure I agree that that's entirely what this film is about, but there are good stretches where it is serving to almost drill into your mind how much suffering and anguish and pain those of us who accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior would have had to have gone through on our behalf. And I think that's the point of the movie. There really is a very tailored audience for who this film is supposed to be received by. And even though it had a wider net cast than that, and we talked about kind of the international market, I think that's where this film specifically was targeted to begin with. Well, I think I think clearly the problem comes in. The critics who did Pandit had no necessarily religious undertone. I mean, this is something that speaks to you as somebody who has a religious faith in Christianity because it is supposed to pull away all the blinders, the veils, the secrecy, the enigma of what took place on Good Friday so that you clearly understand the torture that was involved. If you do not understand or have some belief or understanding of what this was supposed to have done, it just looks like a highly violent, almost snuff film. And you're not going to understand why it was done this way. I disagree with that. I, I know that intellectually or academically, people can understand why it was done. Whether it holds any water or meaning for them varies if you have no religious affiliation. I think that the intended audience for this movie was so specific because there's so much ritualistic behavior in organized religion particularly around certain holidays where on Good Friday we take off of work early and we go to the, what is it, timber service or timbre service? Timbre. And yeah, which started in our particular congregation at, was it 1110 or 1210? One of those 12, where it was 10. 
it was supposed to simulate the hour and moment of Christ's crucifixion. And we hold the service in the dark and we sing certain hymns and we go through all these motions, but it fails to deliver the appreciation sometimes of the magnitude to which one person allegedly on behalf of the entire world paid for all of our weaknesses, iniquities, transgressions against one another, between one another, against ourselves, in order to allow us the opportunity for what we believe is eternal life. And as such, the meaning of this film is baked into the degree to which you had to carry it, I believe, to get its full impact. That's not to say that if you watched it as an outsider, I, that you couldn't get an appreciation, but it doesn't hold the same meaning for you. In fact, I would venture to say that it's senseless violence or violence for the sake of violence to be inflicted, even though it's in some accuracy what really happened to most people that were victims of the Romans at the time. About a year before this, a book came out called The Case for Christ, written by a man named Lee Strobel. In there, he um, originally had been hired or had got a retainer to write a book disproving Christianity and supporting atheism. And after he started, he ended up flipping it and becoming like this very popular Christian author. I read the book, and there was an entire chapter in there about the crucifixion. Most people don't understand. If you remember from the film, if you've saw, hopefully you've seen the film, the two uh, thieves who were crucified next to Christ were not bloodied and beaten like Christ. It's because the Romans had a choice. They either beat you with whips or they crucified you. They seldom, if ever, did both. Well, they ended up doing both because Pontius Pilate wanted to do something to avoid a crucifixion. So he had them tortured or beaten, whipped, you know, with those uh, cat of nine tails. They had metal shards, bone chips, stones, etc., to, to uh, score the flesh. So seldom did you ever see both happen. Well, he went through both punishments, and that's a point that Strobel made. And until you read the book, and it's pretty sobering when you read what took place or what tradition and archaeologists have said was a uh, Roman torture or Roman whipping and what was a Roman crucifixion, either of those were almost to the point of killing you. I mean, well, you know, they whipped you to the po almost to the point of death. And then you turn around and crucifixion was supposed to be a slow, agonizing death caused by asphyxiation because you couldn't breathe anymore because the weight pulling across your chest cavity from hanging, you slowly lost the ability to breathe and you strangled to death. And so it wasn't until this film came out that I think people really grasp how gruesome and horrible the two processes were. And so again, I think from an outside perspective, if you just watch this for the historical value of watching who we know a historical figure to be and his eventual demise, you would think that this is for lack of a better term, torture porn, but obviously takes on a different meaning if you are the intended audience that is supposed to see a larger picture of what this film is supposed to be about. Now, with that in mind, the critic ratings on this, I already read before, Rotten Tomatoes, we had a 49%, 47% on Metacritic, and Letterboxd, which isn't exactly the critics, but it's usually a bunch of film nerds headed at 3.3 .3 out of 5. However, and I usually don't read our audience scores this early into the show, but I think it is somewhat telling. 
we had a 92% on Google users. We had an 80% for Rotten Tomato users. <laughs> so there is a wide gap between the critical community and the yes. audience that received it. Now, part of that could be written away with saying that it comes a lot or stems a lot from the religious community who obviously had a certain fervor for this film and defended it somewhat tooth and nail against a lot of the attacks that it endured. However, what do you say is the difference between the public perception of this film and the critical perception of the film? Well, first of all, a lot of people went to see this film who abhor Hollywood and the traditional movie as being immoral and inappropriate for religious people. So you have an entirely different crowd going. You're not going to get the, the normal cinephile going to this movie. So you're going to have a wider gap to begin with. Second of all, the critics tend to match up closer to the cinephile than to any other group. So there's going to be an automatic disparity between the two groups. And that also impacts the critics. I find it interesting that the one critic who really seemed to love the film being Roger Ebert talked about his being a altar boy as a uh, young man growing up in the Catholic church. So even he had some background in this. And I think that's really the ultimate is, is whether it matched up with your personal faith in a religion or whether you just looked at it as a piece of cinema. And I would agree. I think that there can be a gap between certain movies within the critical community who just analyze its strengths or weaknesses as a film. But this story, while a common narrative and one that is part of Western canon, can only be understood if you are familiar with the story of essentially Easter, Good Friday into, into Easter. And as such, it takes on some level of faith, knowing that you know enough of the beats of the story, it doesn't have to re-explain certain things to you. In fact, I think that's the reasoning Mel Gibson gave for putting the entire movie in either older Aramaic or I would assume Greek or Latin. I know there was like two different languages used for the course of the film. But that his reasoning was, is you know the lines almost verbatim if we're just pulling scripture, that putting it in English would have only been serving to undermine the severity or the authenticity of the film. So while there are a lot of critics, and I think I watched this film a lot differently given where I am contextually, from where I was 20 years ago and I was a kid and I didn't know much about movies and the rest of that. I think my opinion on this film is not so much from a place where I only see it in a religious context and whether it aids additional meaning, because I do think that the film works in those areas, but because it takes and gives you a lot of other peripheral things within the course of the film I don't know if it accomplishes what it was advertised or billed to be about. It distracts in so many ways with things that I feel are irrelevant and that rather anger me as a Lutheran Christian person. And I would have rather seen some of the choices made differently so that it actually did accomplish the goal that it allegedly set out to accomplish. I understand what your, some of your criticisms are going to be. And I actually have countermanding concepts or arguments that I can put up against them as to why they were necessary. Okay. I guess we'll, we'll kind of talk about that progressively throughout the course of our, I guess, review or the episode, but. Sure. The last real thing that I'd like to kind of discuss in this opening and let's say preamble, is this a fair movie 
towards both Christians and Jews, who are the two groups that I would say most closely involved and derive meaning out of this story. The question is, is it factual? And if you follow factually what took place in the four Gospels, it tends to mirror that. I know there's some arguments that could be made that, you know, Jesus didn't really exist, although uh, contemporaneous writings from Romans and other uh, people of that time discussed Jesus. A uh, Roman historian of Jewish origin, his name was Josephus, writes extensively about Jesus and the crucifixion and the rise of the early Christian church. And he came at this as a secular individual writing history for the Roman Empire. So there's enough evidence here that, you know, this likely did take place. Whether you believe it has religious context or not I, is up to you, but it did take place. So is it accurate? I think it was. Now, is it fair to Christians and Jews? I, I don't know how to answer that. You know, I know that there's an argument or people that say this is anti-Semitic, but it wasn't it wasn't like the entire Jewish population was involved in the crucifixion. It was a certain group of people. You can't paint a broad brush over a certain or a whole group. Moreover, it had more to do with sin and human ego and thirst for power and influence than it did anything else. And that's not limited to Christians and Jews or any specific group of people. It takes a broad brush. So I, I don't, I never did figure out exactly why this was deemed anti-Semitic. And I, to this day, I still don't understand exactly why people are anti-Semitic. And I hear the term, you know, well, they killed Jesus. Jesus was Jewish. I mean, as were the apostles. So it wasn't about that. I, I never have understood that. What I understand, and maybe I don't have an, a full appreciation of this, is that in the name of Christianity, a lot of people who are affiliated Protestants, Lutherans, Catholics, Christians, period, have used the basis of the crucifixion and their rejection of Christ, not only in the moment, but subsequently, as a basis to persecute them. I don't know historically how accurate the religious angle of it is so much as all of the other affiliated racial connotations, but it stands to reason that it could have started out as, well, they're the ones who killed Jesus. And then it kind of snowballs from there to, well, they're in positions of power. And even though they're a limited group, they have their hands on the levers of power, et cetera, et cetera. I'm first off, let me clarify and say, I am not making these accusations or anything else. I am simply repeating back historically accusations leveled against the Jewish community. So let me preface that a little bit because I may have been a slightly bit reckless in that moment there. Now, whether this specific movie does anything then other than specifically repeat scripture, even to the point where they kept it in in the movie, but they don't subtitle it. The line from Matthew, then let his blood be on us and on our children, which supposedly has received so much uh, additional backlash and consternation over time, so as to supposedly rip it almost out of scripture that it has some anti-Semitic nature to it. And people have tried to then, after the fact, explain it away and do all of this two-stepping to get around that particular issue. But if we are to assume that not necessarily the Jews, but a lot of people who were Jewish at the time, or let's say Hebrew, plotted to kill Jesus because they were afraid that he would usurp their religious authority and power, and were able to stir up a crowd behind being able to 
through a government means, murder our Lord. From a historical perspective, in this manner, I don't know if I could say that undercutting that or leveling those types of historical quote-unquote accuracies makes this anti-Semitic. It may make it a little bit reckless where a perceived audience may associate certain things, but I don't find it to be, and again, through my own lens as a Protestant man in middle America, I don't know if I can see it as anti-Semitic. But then again, I've also grown up in the traditions and heard that particular passage, I think from Matthew, many, many, many times. So it's hard for me to get maybe out of that lens and see where the angle is from a historical perspective that gives me additional pause to say, yes, this might have been associated with a lot of anti-Semitism. But I don't know if it's fair to Christianity either. I'm going to offer a term where, going back to our last discussion point, or the last question I asked, whether why was the, there a disparity between critics and the general audience? There seems to be a lot of gap between those in an audience perspective and those in the critical community on a lot of quote unquote religious films. And I think it reminds me in a way watching a few of these different films and now seeing it through more of a film perspective aspect especially with how much certain groups of people will only go to these types of movies. I see it as Christ exploitation. There is a specific genre of film specifically catered to a very individualized group, and they are very receptive to these specific types of films. And this, more than most others, capitalized on a particular angle to make it unique and had certain star power making behind it due to Mel Gibson's prominence at the time, both as a director and as a known figure to make this film as successful as it was. And I'm not sure that some of the choices that were made in here are overly fair to the depiction or the meaning of what I would want non-Christians to take out of a film such as this where because of the fervor, you could have made a film that would be much more relatable and maybe not necessarily, I, I don't want to put it as recruitment, but because that makes it sound like a cult as opposed to what I believe it to be, but a conversion tool. And that, even that sounds terrible. No. Evangelism tool. Maybe that's the best word for it. An evangelism tool to non-believers and not just catered specifically to the audience that was already receptive to it. And I don't think that they took some of those opportunities. In fact, I think they kind of closed the door a little bit behind them and said, this is only for an intended audience. And so that to me seems a little bit unfair where I've often thought Christians are the worst evangelism tools for Christianity. And as somebody unaffiliated right now, I really have a problem with that. It's why I'm unaff unaffiliated at the moment. But you could have used this for so much else. And instead, it just becomes something that I think the rest of the world deadpans and sees us as different again. So with that, now that we've... Uh, <laughs> bored the pants off of everybody by going like seriously hard into a movie that I feel I will pick apart for the next hour. Do you have more background for us on this movie? Do you have our plot summary ready for us? Yes. Passion of the Christ directed by Mel Gibson depicts the final hours of Jesus Christ's life, focusing primarily on the lead up to his crucifixion. The movie portrays Jesus's betrayal by Judas Iscariot, his trial before Pontius Pilate, the brutal scourging and mocking by Roman soldiers, and ultimately, his crucifixion and death. The film is notable for its graphic and intense depictions of the events of Jesus' suffering and death, 
aiming to provide a visceral and emotional experience for viewers through its portrayal of Jesus' sacrifice. The Passion of the Christ explores themes of redemption, faith, and the enduring power of love and forgiveness. Thank you. Did you know? In interviews with Newsweek magazine and several other media, Jim Caviezel spoke about the difficulties he experienced while filming. This included being accidentally whipped twice, which has left a 14-inch scar on his back, and dislocating his shoulder from the weight of the cross. Caviezel also admitted he was struck by lightning while filming the Sermon on the Mount and during the crucifixion. His hair actually caught fire from this, but he was otherwise miraculously unharmed. The scenes of him hanging on the cross in the dead of Italian winter with temperatures of 25 degrees Fahrenheit caused him to contract hypothermia and pneumonia. Finally, because makeup was used to create a swollen eye, his lack of depth perception gave him migraine headaches. Did you know? It would usually take over 10 hours to put Caviezel into the scourged makeup. On some of those days, it would happen that the weather conditions turned out to be unsuitable for filming. To avoid spending more hours to have it removed and reapplied the next day, he kept it on and went to bed in full makeup. Did you know? During the scourging scene, Jim Caviezel accidentally got whipped twice. A whipping post that would take the blows was set up behind him so that the camera wouldn't pick it up, but one of the actors accidentally missed it and hit Caviezel instead. The first time it hurt so much that it knocked the wind out of him, with Caviezel stating that, I may be playing Jesus, but I felt like Satan at that moment, causing him to curse out in pain at the other actor. The second time it caused him to wrench his hand quickly from his shackles, scraping his wrist badly. The remainder of the scourging scenes were finished by visual effects. The actors playing Roman soldiers held sticks without the leather tails and acted out the whipping motion, while Caviezel would react as if hit. The tails were later digitally composited into the shots. Makeup wounds on Caviezel's body were digitally covered until the actual hit by the whip, creating the illusion that they suddenly appeared. Did you know? When Jesus speaks the words, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, as he looks up to the sky, his pupils dilate. This is a common sign of death, as all the muscles in one's body relax completely. Did you know? According to Caleb Deschanel, the majority of the movie was shot with a speed above the normal 24 frames per second. This created a sense of relative slow motion in most scenes, which gave the performances and events more weight and drama. I'm not sure I agree with that, but that's another matter for later on. With that, we will take our first break and we will be right back. Before we jump back into the episode, next week for our 206th episode, we return to one of the most celebrated films of all time, with The Godfather, written and directed by Francis Ford Coppola and Mario Puzo, music by Nino Rota, starring Marlon Brando, Al Pacino, James Caan, Diane Keaton, Robert Duvall, and John Cazale. You won't want to miss that one, so watch ahead of the show by searching the Real Good app to find where it's streaming for you. That's R-E-E-L-G-O-O-D. Dad, we left off at best performance. Who do you have down? I have Mel Gibson. He wrote, he directed. This was his project. He's the heart and soul of this. And uh, for better or worse, he um, deserves the credit for it. I will definitely and fully give him credit. Unfortunately, because I give him most of the primary credit for this movie and because it maybe is the most angry I've been coming out of a movie we've watched for the show since the quiet man. I can't nominate him for anything. I think there are choices in here that are ridiculous, asinine bordering on inappropriate <laughs> and at best maybe disheartening. And so it's very difficult for me to give him anything other than just a big L on this one, particularly with the choices that he makes for depiction of the devil and how that somehow comes into the story. I, I did see one critic compared it to a David Lynch fever dream, and in some senses that's somewhat accurate, but why there is a 
hairy Benjamin Button baby that the devil is holding in one scene is beyond me. Why we needed 300, even though 300 came out after this film, but 300 style slow-mo action sequences in the depiction of the suffering of Christ makes no sense to me whatsoever. The choices to focus on so many things that are in the periphery that aid nothing to what this film was sold as means nothing. And then they also miss so many opportunities to add real life communications. Like if you're going to give a little bit of additional storyline, if you're going to take some chances, create some creative license with this. I know it's in a little bit of the style of maybe last temptation of Christ, but show us the inner monologue of Christ on film a little bit better than this. Show us the inner monologue with Peter or John or Judas a lot better than what they're doing there, where Judas's internal guilt is manifested by children chasing him out into the middle of some area so that he can pull the rope off a donkey and hang himself. I don't get the inclusion of that storyline here at all, when you could have done so much more that was expansive and telling with that. Now, this is not to get on you. I, I can respect that you nominated Mel Gibson. I can respect the reasons why. But ultimately, I had to leave him off of everything, even though this, you are accurate. It is his movie. But it's for all of those reasons, and I just wanted to maybe get a little bit of that out of the way so we don't have to spend more time on it. But I went with Jim Caviezel as my best performer because I think he's one of the better things about the movie as a convincing Christ. You definitely see him as broken, beaten, scarred, and somebody who, while completely willing to give up his own life, is clearly going through a lot. And I don't think there was anything in Caviezel's performance that was distracting or detracting from the accomplishment of the film in its brutality. So for me, his vulnerability, his ability to convey that on screen is what makes him the best performer I could nominate for this category. I have him as secondary. But going back to some of your comments regarding Mel Gibson, he had to undertake this film in a way, I mean, he was going to get criticism for anti-Semitism. So he, I think, creates the vehicle of the devil being actively involved to portray that it was no one's or no group, no individual's responsibility, but a higher evil that overtook. That's why the devil is shown throughout this. Do I like the way it was done? Not really, but I understand to some extent why it was done in order to provide it as an opportunity for discussion and something that would be palatable to a mass audience. And so to that extent, I'm giving him kudos for at least trying to do something to make this more palatable towards certain portions of society, which would find it difficult to watch, understand, or appreciate the film. If that is the reasoning behind it, while I can understand and appreciate it, and frankly, that's a fairly reasonable understanding of what may have happened, but I would actually criticize him a bit more because that excuses what I believe most Christians to believe. While the devil is capable of driving you into some level of temptation or aiding you along, I still think that the responsibility bared for sin in general, is one that we all must share. And so it takes the ownership or the responsibility off of us individually, collectively, putting Christ on the cross and through that level of suffering. So I don't know if I would agree with that choice even more. I understand your point. My biggest criticism with the film is the lack of showing Christ's love, humanity, forgiveness, 
because I think the level of sacrifice made throughout this, the violence, the horror that he had to experience would have been even more difficult to swallow, more difficult to watch if you would have understood how totally innocent and loving he was as a person towards all elements of society. And the lack of this, just starting out in in Gethsemane and, and uh, after the Last Supper, him praying for, you know, to be relieved of this and his torture prayers. That's, a, I thought, a very interesting place to start the film because there are certain flashbacks to the Last Supper and some other things, the Sermon on the Mount, how he um, cast stones to protect Mary Magdalene. Uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of different flashbacks, but I don't think it did a very good job of showing how innocent he was to then have to suffer these things. So in re response to you, as far as Caviezel, he did the best job I think he could by the looks in his eyes of forgiveness, disappointment, anguish that I think I could tell from, because you can't, I mean, he's saying the lines, so the lines mean nothing. He has to convey this by body language and facial expression and such more than anything. And he did a very good job of doing that. So that's why he's my secondary performance. So I went with Maya Morgenstern. I believe that's right. As the Mother Mary, the depths to which that character could have been easily overplayed as the wailing mother and could have had so many jokes leveled against it in that level of a performance because the response to this level of violence perpetrated against one of your children would have been debilitating, I would assume, for most parents. Not being one myself, I, I can't completely sympathize. I can only empathize with the situation. But I thought she was very honest in her portrayal, wanting to see his death because she was concerned for her child and simultaneously knew the man that he was, but also having such a difficult time with everything that was going against him. And so the back and forth nature of that portrayal, I thought was very convincing and was an added layer to the film that I don't think you get an appreciation for just purely reading the words of scripture. Most charismatic, I have Christo Namov Shopov. I believe that's how you pronounce it, but I have Pontius Pilate. Another performance I thought was additive to the film. In scripture, we get this kind of flat, two-dimensional Pontius Pilate who washes his hands of the situation and he hems and haws and tries to back out of actually having to do anything. But the reality with which he's grappling, trying to prevent uprising, which was his job as the governor of the territory, with, I would assume, other uprisings that had happened against the Roman Empire of the time, the nature, even if it was a throwaway and it wasn't historically accurate, but giving a little bit of extra gravitas saying that he could be on the chopping block if another uprising goes poorly or he isn't able to stem uprisings or rebellions with this mob that is coming after him trying to kill somebody who he knows to be innocent. Then throw in the factor of his wife constantly coming to him and trying to beg or plead for his mercy on the situation and whether he believes her or not. So him being pulled from all sides, I thought was actually a fairly convincing performance. And again, I would probably say that it added to the film in a way that other things or other choices did not. My most charismatic is Monica Bellucci. Whenever I see her on screen, I'm just drawn to her. There's just something about certain people when they show up on a screen, you just automatically go 
and and or your eyes are drawn to them and you watch them. They could be in the middle of a crowd and you still watch them. And she's one of those people. Let's go to best scene then. I have five down. I have the trial of Jesus before Caiaphas and the high priest in the temple. I then, I think there are two different times that were before Pilate, but I chose the second of those. Then I have the flagellation, which is an extended sequence. I have the carrying of the cross, which you could break up into individual things, but I went with the entirety of it because I think as one collective scene, it works much better than it would individually or separated. And then I have finally the crucifixion itself. Did you have any ones that you wanted to add? No. Okay. I, I tried to hit most of the big moments or highlights, but out of these, what do you think is the best scene? Carrying the cross. I agree. I mean, it's by far the most poignant. Um, you can see the most interaction between Christ, the Roman soldiers, the crowd, the pain he's enduring, the anguish, the um, fatigue. It's just by far the scene that lets you experience and feel as what much as you can. And I'm say, not saying that you have any ability to empathize with his situation because I don't think anybody has been through or very few people have been through that level of torture and pain. But still, it gives you the best opportunity to understand and empathize. I appreciated it as the best sequence of the film, specifically because you know that the flagellation and the crucifixion are the two that are going to be the most violent and the two that are probably the most explicit within scripture. But if I remember right, there's only one of the four gospels that discusses the carrying of the cross. And so for what they do to expand upon that journey with, oddly enough, a cross that I guess we don't get an appreciation for most people, when you think of a cross, I think in a Western civilization nature, probably think it's a couple of two by fours. That's a 150 pound cross that Caviezel's carrying in that sequence. And if that's historically accurate, after having your back and sides whipped to the point of potential exposure of your intestines, and then you have to carry something that's 150 pounds, I have no idea how he could have done it. It just seems impossible. And the nuances that are conveyed within that scene, again, I'm looking for things that add to my experience and my understanding and give me added meaning to my faith than I am just simply for the accuracy of the vision of what I had in my head. And so when I'm looking at Caviezel's performance or Morgan Stern's or this scene, I think these are all added benefits to my understanding and my appreciation of what I believe. Favorite scene? For me, it was before pilot. I've always thought that was by far the most interesting part of this, how pilot basically tried so many different ways to avoid the outcome that took place. I think it is the best character study within the course of the film. The rest of them are just raw pieces of human emotion, but they give us some actual background on the character a little bit in order to give us some level of catharsis by the end of his scenes within the film. And even to a degree, his, I guess, uh, right-hand guy. So for me, I think this is by far the most interesting of the sequences beyond the just raw violence that we get in most of the other parts of the movie. Yeah, it, it did not rehabilitate Pontius Pilate clearly enough because obviously there aren't too many children running around from that were born in that time frame that are named Pontius. Most indelible moment, I think it has to be the flagellation. They go to such a painstaking extent to make that almost seemingly as important as the crucifixion itself to the suffering of Christ that I think it it carries a 
almost larger weight seeing it on screen, even though I think they do a lot of quick cuts in that and they probably could have shown a lot more of the violence. And maybe that's my ability or my deadened ability, let's say, for violence after how many different movies to say that there could have been more violence, but it's the most stark moment or sequence within the film for my mind. For me, it was the crucifixion. Just visualizing the actual statements that are within the Bible about, you know, the earthquake and how things were, the earth shook. And to me, it just brought it to home and it had more meaning and impact at the moment of death. So that'll take us to our second break. We will be right back. Before we jump back into the episode, and before we get to the Stanley rubric in a minute, if you're ever curious about our Master Greatest Movies of All Time list that has every greatest movie we've ever discussed on the show, there's a link in the episode description of every episode of this show, or you can go to ronnieduncanstudios.com backslash podcast and find it as the top entry on the Greatest Movie of All Time podcast show page. That has the grades we've done so far for all 190 movies we've graded, and we continue to add more each week. Make sure to check that out as we go and follow along. Also, you can follow each individual episode on our website as well. That has the notes for each individual episode with all of our scores, category nominations, and the individual factoids for each episode of the show. Just click the link in the episode description of this episode or go to ronnieduncanstudios.com backslash podcast to find that. Dad, do we have anyone to remember this week? Yes. David Sedler, 86, British-American screenwriter. The King's Speech, Quest for Camelot, Tucker, The Man in His Dreams. Oscar winner in 2010. For The King's Speech. Tucker, The Man in His Dreams is a very underrated film. With Steve Bridges. You, you can't make such an inside <laughs> joke that only has meaning to you, myself, and my little sister Sarah without like some greater explanation on the show that it's just not going to make know. any sense. Anyway, I guess for any of those that personally know us, just ask us about steep bridges. Anyway, the point being is Tucker is a very underrated film. I thought with, with Jeff bridges, David Brashears, 68 American mountaineer and filmmaker did the documentary film Everest. Robin Bernard, 64 American actress was on, General Hospital. And Joe Camp, 84 American film director, Benji, Humps, and the Double MacGuffin, also was known as a writer. And so we remember these here fondly for their contributions with a moment of silence in their honor. Thank you. And with that, we will move to best lines and do something I don't believe we've ever done, and that is skip best lines. Now, the reason for doing so is that the majority of the lines are those that come from Scripture, and nominating words of Scripture when we've already probably been proselytizing at you this entire episode feels like a bit of overkill. So, in the interest of moving this a little bit along and that I don't think there were any lines that aren't scripture necessarily that I felt were additive to the experience of this film. Let's move on and go right to the Stanley rubric. Legacy is up first. Would you like to go first or second? I will bow to your annoyance. Well, I have to be somewhat objective because with Legacy and impact and significance. I think a lot is made of people's opinions that are not necessarily my own. So with legacy, on an industry perspective, there are two camps. There's the critical community, and then there are those that are the industry representatives that recognize this for the money-making potential it had and tried to capitalize on some of that. And so for the executives that ended up making enormous amounts of money on the back of this film, and I would assume are the ones primarily helping to finance, I guess, the now sequel, which may be broken up into multiple films, according to Caviezel that I saw, 
I think there is at least a little bit of respect or begrudging respect that maybe the critics didn't have. And so because of that, and because it still has some notoriety within the industry, and to a certain extent, has kept Mel Gibson kind of afloat compared to a lot of the other films that he's directed since, I give this a 3.5 on the industry side of things. As far as the legacy, though, with the public, at least for an American audience who has a lot of Judeo-Christian traditionalism within it, this film still has a very high name ID. And even if you haven't seen this, like I don't think people are watching this necessarily once a year for Easter or something like that. But I think a good portion of the population has seen this movie at least once and within somewhat of a living memory understands what it was like to watch the film. So I'm going to give it a 4.5 from an audience perspective, and I have an 8. I'm giving it a little bit down for industry because after this film was released, Mel Gibson got picked up by a Jewish police officer in Los Angeles for drunk driving and very famously uh, made very anti-Semitic comments. And the fact that that happened on the heels of release of this film within, I want to say it was within 12 to 18 months. I think it was closer to two years, but it's not necessarily that far away. Yeah. I think that in a certain level within society and especially in the industry, I think it fed into the fact, you know, the, some of the critics said that this film is anti-Semitic. I think it really did a poor service to not just to Mel Gibson, but to the film itself. So I went with a three. And really, I understand that people have seen the film once, but other than to mention it, I, I don't find that people really, this is not something people go, oh yeah, we need to watch it this year at Easter. Well, you know, this is a must see thing. So but I you're think venturing it's, into rewatchability territory with that. No, I, I I know, but I'm just talking about how much of an impact it has over that five year period and beyond, and I don't think it has much. So uh, I went with a three there as well. So I have a six. So that's a seven average between the two of us. Impact and significance. This is one of the bigger surprise money makers that anybody who was in on the ground floor and had opportunities to be a part of it, anyone who was an EP or just even a plain old producer on the film made their entire fortunes potentially on the back of this movie. This on a $30 million budget, which I think part of it was just in the production expense. Like the marketing was much more of a word of mouth thing among certain communities that it was coming out made so much money as to be laughable comparative to what other movies were being made for mentioning that in the same year, the top movies ahead of the passion of the Christ are Shrek Two, Spider-Man two, the third Harry Potter film and the Incredibles which are all major franchise tent poles, three of which are sequels. And yet this made more money than Ocean's 12, Shark Tale, Troy, I, Robot, National Treasure, The Polar Express. It was an enormous movie in its moment. And while I don't think because of the critic reviews at the time that I can go to a full five or give it some of that credence, at least on the industry side of things, I think it's hard to deny, at least within an American perspective, how big this movie got from an audience side of things. So I go for a five on the audience. I am a little bit more malleable on the industry side, but because I think there were people that, again, had a begrudging respect for how surprising and how enormous this movie got. I will go with a four and I have a nine. There were so many critics that were against it. And there were so many within Hollywood that didn't understand it. From the industry, I went with a three. 
And from the public, I did go with a five as well for the reasons you gave, because it was huge, but it was huge in general, but extremely huge within a certain community who tended to be people who did not go and watch film very often. So let me ask a question just to maybe check myself a little bit. We often give a lot of movies that are widely critically acclaimed, but don't necessarily have backing in the general public. Kind of that dichotomy where we'll score high on the industry, where it's a revered movie. For example, it happened one night that we did two weeks ago. That's not a film that's seen among the general public, but it is one that is revered within the industry, given its place as a best picture winner and also the first best picture winner of Frank Capra and put it into a whole bunch of other trivia categories. Am I being a little bit cute when you are correct in saying almost, I would say 80 to 90% of critics did pan the movie, even though we have a 49%. I just don't feel that's quite strong enough for the backlash against the movie and whether it was seen poorly or not. Like any time you get under 50%, this is not seen as a good movie, quote unquote, especially in the modern sense where the rating and the fresh rating dictates so much of how a movie is perceived out in a public discourse. And even though it was nominated for a few Oscars, Within the five-year period, you do bring up that Mel Gibson's stature undercut the film, undercut himself, and the meaning of the film or any other legacy that it may have had going forward, again, within that five-year period, and that there is a separation again, but it's in the inverted way that we normally depict it, where the audience was overwhelmingly in support of the film, And yet the industry was not. Am I being a little soft on the industry in that sense where we have an inverted version and I'm not holding myself accountable enough? I would say yes. It's kind of the very reason why evangelicals and Christian nationalists hate Hollywood. And it's because of this perception of them being anti-faith, anti more traditional values. They're always pushing the envelope, et cetera. And I think that that kind of, I mean, this movie kind of brings that to the surface and brings some level of justification to them for some of these beliefs. Because, I, you know, as much as certain elements of Hollywood preach being more tolerant and reaching out, a film like this does kind of show that, that her willingness to be tolerant only goes into certain directions. It does not go into everyone. So is there maybe an argument that this is actually lower than the three even you gave? The only reason I originally had a 2.5, but you made a really good point about the fact that there were a lot of people who saw this as a potential (laughs) moneymaker, which is kind of sad, but it is realistic. That's why I went and gave it actually, I have down actually a 2.5, but you made that comment. And I'm going, yeah, you're right. So I'm going to mark it up a half a point for that. So I went with a three for that. All right. I will readjust. I think an eight is fair if we give a three on the industry side of it. But there's a part of me that wonders if it would have been more appropriate, even lower, given, I guess, the other criticisms of the film i i thought about it and yeah i mean i i i if you tried to push me and said well you really need to give it a two for the industry i would probably i would i may very well agree with you if you gave a d or enough of an argument all right so that's an eight average between the two of us novelty i don't think that this is high on an originality score a lot of the storylines and even the lines themselves are pulled directly from scripture the novelty or the originality of this particular film is showing the severity or the degree to the violence 
that you wouldn't have gotten anywhere else. And I think that this film is unique in that sense only. So I will go a two and a half roughly on my originality five point scale. And as far as execution, this would be higher if it focused on those things, but it's inability to keep a certain point of view. It's inability to take the subject material beyond in some degrees, what's on the page with the exception of the violence. And I think some rather unnecessary missteps in the filmmaking itself keep this as a two for the execution. So I have a 4.5. Well, I'm, I'm much different. I'm looking at this and I'm going next week. We're going to be doing a revisit of the Godfather. And one of the things that makes The Godfather a novel film compared to other gangster movies is the depiction of The Godfather as a family and a family business who has family rivals, issues, etc. And it portrays it from being just a bunch of killers and criminals into a more traditional belief of an American family rising from the ashes into the American society. This film takes a traditional story. And I can tell you, you know, I could probably rattle off five to 10 religious films. But what this does is it tears away all of that filter, all of the niceties that we try to put into this story and to present it in a uh, clean, homogenized view and lays it raw. And that was the point of this film was to lay it raw and to show you how it really took place and what really happened. So I'm giving it bigger points up for that. I, I went with an 8.5. Because this is the most raw film depicting a series of events that I can honestly say I've seen. The only thing I can even come close to thinking about of exemplifying what really took place is the opening D-Day sequence for Saving Private Ryan. So that's a 6.5 average between the two of us. Classicness. Would you like to go first? Boy, this one was tough because I want to say it's classic because they really didn't do much with it other than follow what was in the scriptures except interspersing artistic license with some things. But the question then becomes is, is it classic because or, you know, despite the level of violence? And so I kind of went back and forth and I'm going, well, it's real. So if it's what really took place, how can that not be classic? I struggled to some extent. So I went with an eight for classicness beyond our normal seven. I didn't think anything too not classic about it. So I gave it a points up while they're not primary characters. We have women, we have other people involved that are peripheral to the story who are more adequately developed. So I, I, I struggled, but I went with an eight. This might be the largest gap that we've ever had between scores in a particular category. The anti-Semitism aside, this movie just sheer angers me because again, I think it allows people to think my beliefs are foolish as opposed to grounded in some meaningfulness. If you're going to focus on, Peter, John, and Judas's stories, then again, give them some added weight beyond the text that gives us some appreciation of what they were going through at the time that goes beyond what the story is. If your whole added benefit is just to show the raw violence, I don't, by its sheer inclusion, think that that makes this film that much more important or additive to the Easter story. I think there are so many wasted opportunities in this. So many things that I find objectionable 
not only to my own personal beliefs, but just the story overall and how it's related to a general population. For example, the the devil's depiction, not just in the weird <laughs> Benjamin Button baby thing that I, I, I still, that was literally a what the fuck moment for me. But the devil is a Italian actress with a shaved head who most Western civilization depictions of the devil usually are of a man. And there was just enough of a way in which she was filmed that made you think that there was some questionability that I find to be unnecessary in this movie. Now, again, this is before a lot of the transgender backlash. This is still in the heyday of what I would call the gay bashing era. But even it's just sheer inclusion of trying to make the devil a woman seems unnecessary. The devil by itself, I also find to be unnecessary. And a lot of the portions of this film, beyond the just boring and bloated, go into the territory of active anger for me. I think that's where the difference between something that's like a four or a five in classicness sometimes that's just, it's run of the mill, it's of its time, it's, you know, it hasn't aged well, it's not necessarily timeless, to something that I find offensive as I do somewhat of this film. I think that's what drops it to the eventual score I ended up at which was a two. I will give you an extra half a point for your mention or the inclusion of developing the stories of his mother. Maybe a, a point I hadn't necessarily considered, but this film still angers me having watched it a couple of days ago already. Well, the film, he made the choice to make the devil androgynous because Sin is not male, it's not female. So by making the devil into something that could be interpreted as male or female, clarify that it was neither. So I, I don't go there with that for that point you're making. Now, do I Again, have I just feel it's unnecessary to include it at all. Well, okay. I I I, I don't have as much problem with it as you do. So that's fine. It's about time we disagree more on this show. Here, here. So that's a 5.25 average between the two of us. Rewatchability. If I ever put it on again, it's going to be because I almost feel like I'm backed into putting it on. I will almost actively avoid putting it on of my own volition. So for that portion or that half of things, I went with a 0.5. And my reasons for leaving it on are so few. It is not something that will just be found on and that I would ever leave on just for the sake of it. Because I think only about half the film I found actual value in. I have a 1. I have a 1.5, which might be my individual worst rewatchability score I've ever given. Okay, for me, I would much rather reread Lee Strobel's book than watch this film again. I think it does a better job. I think it's more articulate. It gives you context. Other than the visceral aspect of the the visual, I mean, I think the book did a better job. I'd much rather spend time rereading that or portions of that book than when you're watching this film. Will I watch it again? If it's if it's on, no. If uh, I'm trying to show it to somebody who has an interest who's never seen it, I will watch it again for conversation. I went with a four. So that's a 2.75 average between the two of us. For audience score, as I mentioned earlier in the show, we had a 92% for Google users and an 80% for Rotten Tomato users, giving us a 8.6. So to recap the categories, we had a seven for Legacy. We had an 8 for Impact and Significance. We had a 6.5 for Novelty. We had a 5.25 for Classicness. We had a 2.75 for Rewatchability. 
and an 8.6 for audience score, giving us a final total of... 38.1. And placing it on our list, tied with Idiocracy. <laughs> oh, 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 wow. Uh. Okay. Well, some might say that that is a uh, match made in hell. Yeah. If you disagree with any of our scoring, and I think that my takes on the movie may either be solely appreciated or wholly dismissed. And if you don't personally know me enough to stop me and uh, chastise me in person, you can write us at greatest all time movie podcast at gmail.com. You can find us on any of our socials at Gmoat Podcast. And that's for YouTube, TikTok, X, Letterboxd, Facebook, Instagram, etc. Or you can find us on our website, RonnieDuncanStudios.com backslash Gmoat Podcast. Let's move into the few remaining questions I haven't already talked about. <laughs> if you can openly see a rib cage. Wouldn't it be likely that Christ's lung would have been punctured and killed him before he even got on the cross? No, because the rib cage is the protective. You know, unless the rib cage is compromised, how is the lung going to be punctured? They tore the flesh off of his ribs. Yes. With stuff that was puncturing his flesh. Now, depending on the depth of it, you wouldn't think that it would tear the flesh away from his rib cage unless it was puncturing and digging in below or through or around the rib cage. No. And so depending on the depth, and again, I am the only one of us too that does not pretend to be a medical expert. To me, my intuition says there would have been something attacking the lung. Think of how thick the ribs are. And the fact that there's cartilage in between the ribs, it's, it's thick. We're talking about an inch. Just because the flesh on the outside is torn in does not mean that it, it's going to get through an inch of bone and or cartilage to puncture the lungs. So this one I think you're way off base on. All right. Do you have any remaining questions? Well, you know, I guess the only remaining question is there is a sequel that's coming out. And is the sequel really intended for promotion of the religious concept, or is this just a money grab? The very cynical side of me that has already coined the term Christploitation would say it's the latter. If you would like to give them the benefit of the doubt, I understand. Well, I think Jim Caviezel is very sincere. It's hard for me, though, to think that Mel Gibson at this point is the most credit I could give him at best is that I think he's trying to drive a narrative as opposed to doing it solely for the money. But even that in that cynical nature of mine is that he's pushing a, a supposed again, somewhat Christian nationalist viewpoint as opposed to it being for any greater ulterior motive where he's evangelizing. Well, I think there's a certain element of politics that's also involved. And I have some questions about Caviezel's political um, views, especially after um, what I found out about his film from, was it this year? Or was it early this year or was it last year? The sound Given of that we've only had freedom? two two and a half months so far. Last, or I mean of 2023. Yes, it was within the last 12 months, but it is not in this calendar year, I should clarify. Okay. Anyway, that's my only comment. Then uh, remaining thoughts for the week. I'm looking forward, actually, to going to see Ghostbusters. I'm going to go see it because, you know, it brings back the nostalgia, putting back Ernie Hudson, Bill Murray, and John Aykroyd, I think, will... Dan? Or, excuse me. Yes, Dan Aykroyd will bring it, tie it together. The modern franchise with the nostalgia associated with it 
from my age group, having gone and seen the film in the theaters. So we will be covering the original film for its 40th anniversary later this year. I think before you see the new version, you have to see the first sequel. And I thought they did an excellent job at giving it a new feel with new characters that are developed while giving appreciation, respect, and reverence to the an original homage. film. Not, not even so much as an homage, because that seems to be like you're doing your own thing, but that you'll pay respect to it. No, it intricately involves a lot of things that some might have deemed fan service, but I thought paid great respect to what had been laid down before it and didn't try so much to do with that its own thing that it didn't feel like what the original spirit had captured. And so I'm going to be glad to see the next sequel, which comes out this weekend. And I know if you're listening live or when this is exactly released after the movie has actually been released or the weekend after it's been released. But even so, I think that those movies, I'm glad to see another remake that is going well, or at least tries to recapture the spirit or the idea, the soul of something that I think a lot of people hold as beloved. And I know the two guests that we are supposed to be having on for that particular episode are very enthusiastic. So it should be a lot of fun when we get to that point. And we have two remaining, at least in our pocket, ask Dana anything questions. If uh, you would like to send us any more, please again write us at greatest all time movie podcast at gmail.com or at gmote podcast on any of our socials. But are you prepared? Uh, sure. All right. Question number one Describe the rest of your life in five words. Okay. I must be used up. What? I must be used up. I want to live my life in such a way that I want to be productive. I want to do things. I want to leave a legacy. I want to be put things in writing. I want to create. I want to be as much as I can until I am completely used up. And when I die, there's nothing left but the legacy I've left behind to everyone else. Definitely not to make any criticisms of a, I would say, rather serious question, or at least one that's heartfelt, but it feels like the tagline for an off-brand toothpaste. <laughs> Actually, I happened to see an episode of Late Night with Jeff Goldblum, and they asked him a question, and he quoted it. I'm trying to think where or he was quoting a writing from somebody and I can't remember offhand who he was quoting, but he used the term. I want to be completely used up. And I just thought that was the, one of the most profound things I thought of is I've got so many things I want to do and so many ideas and so many things creatively that I'd like to try and do that. I just want to get to a point where I just want to reach a point where I've done everything I can and I can look back and say, I've done what I've wanted. I have provided, I've done a lot to help humanity and society and that I want to be to the point where people look back and go, he did so much or he was so profound, whatever. I don't know, but I just want to be to the point where every bit of my energy and my being is used up to make things better when I leave. And yet you want me to play Aqualung at your funeral. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> uh, because ultimately, I, I love a good joke. And I would love nothing better than to have one from the grave. All right. Question two. This is pretty standard, but... You're stranded on a desert island, and you can only watch five movies for the rest of your life. What are they? Blazing Saddles, Rio Bravo, North by Northwest, Patton, and Saving Private Ryan, possibly. All right. It 
dives into my love of of history, but by the same token, my love of humor and comedy. North by Northwest, because ultimately I can fantasize as much as I want to be Cary Grant. It'll never happen, but oh well. Fair enough. So if you have enjoyed the last few weeks with our questions specifically for Dana, please submit new questions. Uh, we have now exhausted those that we had, and uh, we would love to hear from you. Uh, if you would like to know even more about the man, the myth, the legend, please get those in. <laughs> yeah. So with that, that will do it for us this week. Thank you for listening. Today, I settled all family business. Next week for our 206th episode, we return to one of the most celebrated films of all time with The Godfather, written and directed by Francis Ford Coppola with Mario Puzo, music by Nino Rota, starring Marlon Brando, Al Pacino, James Caan, Diane Keaton, Robert Duvall, and John Cazale. You won't want to miss that one, so watch ahead of the show by searching the Real Good app to find where it's streaming for you. That's R-E-E-L-G-O-O-D. Please like, follow, rate, and review, or whatever on whichever platform you have so that more can join in on our fun. You can also email the show at the new RonnieDuncanStudios.com or at greatest all time movie podcast at gmail.com. Find us on YouTube, Instagram, X, Letterboxd, or TikTok at the handle at Gmode Podcast. The Greatest Movie of All Time is a production of Ronnie Duncan Studios. Our show is mixed, edited, and written by Thomas Duncan. Our music is thanks to Purple Planet Music. Our technical provider and distributor is Captivate FM. <laughs>